Hello, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Frank McNally, the Director of Learning and Content Development here at Public Spend Forum. We got a special webinar for today uh, from a gentleman I recently met named Todd Snellgrove. He's the former Global Vice President um, and uh, Value Founding Partner for Experts in Value. And Todd's got a pretty interesting presentation he's going to share with us today it's called Unpacking Best Value understanding and embracing value-based approaches for procurement. And Todd's written a, a white paper and a lot of other content on this topic, and he's going to unpack it for us today uh, in this webinar. I'm going to let Todd introduce himself in just a minute, but I want to do, do a few housekeeping items. Um, Todd, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, most of you all are familiar with Public Spend Forum. We are a market intelligence and best practices platform for public sector buyers and suppliers. What we do is create tools that help connect buyers and suppliers. Uh, you know, we've got a, um, a lot of good content on publicspendforum.net that'll help you, you know, implement best practices, uh, learn how to buy different things in the public sector marketplace, and then connect with a global community of peers and experts in public procurement, like Todd. Uh, we also have just kicked off a new market research platform, Todd, on the next slide, if you will, please, called GovShop. Um, GovShop is a single place to search, find, and connect with suppliers. We're calling it the one-stop shop for government contractor market research. It's easy to use and free. It'll always be free for people to use. It's, uh, it's, it's browser-based, so there's nothing to download. There's no licenses to buy. You can just go to GovShop.com right now and start Googling, I'm sorry, start searching for um, your ideal top government contractors. There's a couple different ways to search, and uh, we got some really neat tutorial videos on GovShop over on our YouTube channel. Um, but that's not the focus of today's webinar. Um, today's webinar is about unpacking best value. And like I said, I'm going to introduce Todd in one second. Just quick housekeeping notes. So I hear Rachel uh, out there. You can't hear anything. Um, I think you might need to make sure you're dialed in on audio. So a quick, a quick update on the Zoom controls. If you hover your mouse sort of at the bottom of your Zoom player, you'll see the uh, phone options um, over on the left. So the audio options, you can either dial in with your computer or you can dial in with the conference line. And I'm gonna copy that and, and, uh, and save that into the chat right now, Rachel. So hang on one second while I do that for anybody who wants to see it. We will be sending out the slides at the end of the session, so no worries there. We'll send out the slides and a recording of the session for everyone. I know that's a very popular question throughout. Uh, I'll be moderating our chat. So if you go to the bottom of your Zoom panel again, there's a, there's a chat balloon right next to the middle button of the screen. There's a, a Q&A button as well. So you can use either of those, um, those options to ask questions. Now Todd has asked that we hold questions till the end. I think he's got to uh, got to get through the material, and then I will be taking questions, and we can address those. He said he's going to keep about 10 minutes open at the end for questions. So um, anybody who's looking for that phone dial-in, I just uh, chatted it in the Zoom webinar chat. Uh, so you can you can dial in that way, Rachel. Hope, hopefully you're able to, to do that. And if anybody else is having any issues with audio or video, please use that chat button. You can, you can send me a chat directly to, to myself or the panelists, and we'll get it. I think that's that's all I've got in terms of housekeeping. I'm really excited about this topic, and uh, I'm going to stop talking and let Todd begin. Todd? Thank you, Frank, uh, and thank you, Public Spend Forums, for putting this together uh, today so we can share some ideas and best practices. Real quickly, background of myself, and I think it's important because of the examples I'll use. Uh, I started off working for a global industrial engineering company over 20 years ago, but on the product management sales side. And what we realized uh, a long time ago was that we needed to start working on quantifying the value for our customers if we were asking them to pay more than the lowest price that meets the minimum requirement. And over the years, I remember I was in South Africa at a very large conference and my CEO was in the audience and he said to me afterwards, Todd, this makes so much sense why we do this. I mean, it's important to have all these great things, but you know, what's the economic impact uh, profit impact for the customer, but what I'm confused about is my buying group, my senior vice president of procurement, I mean, he shows me all these savings all the time, but they never get to my bottom line. I don't think we have a structured way to buy. I don't think we understand exactly what value is and how to negotiate on it. So 
kind of an interesting story. Someone with the sales marketing background, I ended up spending half my time on our procurement side. And what's interesting is, you know, the, the concept of selling and buying shouldn't be different. Uh, he, he was Scottish, but, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, that type of thing, you know. If we're going to sell this way, we should buy this way. And uh, went from a contentious relationship with our chief procurement officer, because why would somebody be coming to talk to him? We're now best friends. He's written actually a chapter from the book that you see there saying, you're right. Uh, we, you know, let's structure this, let's measure it, let's do this uh, the right way so that we are getting that value to our bottom line and it's not getting lost somewhere. So to my knowledge, I was the first global vice president to value, uh, at least in industry. And the examples I use come from actually a lot of uh, research that was funded by the Department, the U.S. Department of Defense. So there is some government examples I'll use. So with that, um, that's interesting. Frank, somehow I am not being, oh, there we go. I got stalled there for a second. Um, first of all, and I won't go through you know, specifically all these, but these are the benefits of taking a different approach to working with your suppliers. You know, what's in it? And again, I'll use companies, but again, profit being the value you can bring to your constituents, uh, you know, translates that way. So Manufacturers Alliance is a big North American uh, manufacturing group big companies that manufacture get together. They did a big survey and said the companies that bought and rewarded suppliers on something called total profit added, which I'll cover in a minute, really it's just an evolution of total cost of ownership. These are publicly traded companies, but they were 35% more profitable. Wow, I mean, it's phenomenal. Again, extracting the right value from the right suppliers and getting it to the bottom line, what an impact. The research I'll be spending a lot of time talking about is from that orange visual you see on the right called Vested Outsourcing. It was funded by uh, the US Department of Defense, but Kate Vitasek, a professor at University of Tennessee Supply Chain Management School, uh, coordinated the research with a bunch of her PhD students, and they went and looked at best practices from business to business. The, uh, the discussion from uh, the Department of Defense was, how come we're not getting more value? This doesn't make sense. We're the biggest buyer in North America, but are we really getting that value? So it's actually based on a 2009 Nobel Economics Prize winner, Professor Williamson's research. What's in it for us, for we, for both? Again, I won't go through all this, but you can see some quotes at the bottom here from uh, a professor at uh, North Carolina State University, Professor Choi from uh, CAPS. Again, we worked together at Center for Advanced Procurement Studies on this evolution from total cost to total profit and a commercial excellence. So what's in it for your bottom line? I start every session, and again, whether I'm talking to procurement people or sales, it doesn't matter. Let's use the right terms. Price, cost, and value are three completely different concepts, even though they each have five letters in them. They mean completely different things, but I'm amazed at how people transpose them all the time. So I, one of the takeaways is hopefully you'll stop and think before you use one of these words in the future because It'll make a difference on what you get. So price is what you pay for something. I'm going to use dollars. We can use euros or yens. It doesn't matter. But $100. So that's, that's what you pay for something. And cost is the price, and it's part of it. We'll discuss later how much of a part of it is. But there's all these other things. There's shipping costs. There's receiving costs. There's inventory costs. There's finance charges. And then there's all the costs while you're using the product, how much energy, how much water, uh, how long will it last? I mean, again, we'll get into specifics in a minute. And value is usually on the upside. Cost is usually about cost reduction, using less of something. But value is on the upside. And with the right procurement strategy, you can obtain a lot of value that creates value for your constituents or profit. Real quickly, the assumption is that if you pay a lower price for something, your cost will go down. That's a Latin saying in the bottom left, ceteris paribus, all things being equal. And I can tell you from 20 years' experience in this that even though things are the same part or brand name, doesn't mean they will operate the same way in your application without the right people delivering it at the right time with the right knowledge. So, you know, you could pay lower for the price for something. And I live in Michigan now, and I think it's well known that, I mean, uh, certain companies, automotive as an example, were able to pay lower prices for certain things, but those price savings never became profit. They got lost somewhere and talk to the financial people in your organization and a cost savings by guarantee becomes profit. So maybe you pay a little higher price but you use less energy or something like that. 
but a cost savings that's hard, true, and measurable actually drives profit or, again, for government people, more services, more efficient services. So um, a lot of procurement people talk about cost savings, and when a salesperson re responds, make sure you define what do we count, how do we measure it, and what is it value to us. So some examples, and you know, some of these are pretty simplistic, but the idea is just to kind of get the idea across. So you've been tasked with buying a widget, a sprocket, uh, a car, a computer. There's always at least two variables or two choices. So in this example, I'll go back to industrial parts, my background, but there's a $10 one and a $15 one, and they both have the same ISO specification. They both look the same. They both conceptually do the same thing. And from a price perspective, the one on the left is whatever, 33% less money. But everything that you're responsible for buying for, you know, marketing services, to travel for your people, whatever it is, always has other costs and benefits. And in this example, in industrial parts, they need to be lubricated to turn. They use energy, inventory. How quickly can you install the machine? How long will the machine last? Again, we won't get into the why and the how now, but this is the supplier's job. And the question is really measuring all those other attributes and putting some numbers to it. In this example, the one on the left, $10 is the price, but $77 is the operating cost. And on the on one on the right, you can see as much less, creating actually $30 of profit impact or more value. So it's the supplier's job to bring this information, but it's our job as procurement people to tell them that's what we value. Because if we don't send that message that I want the lowest total cost or the best value, they won't do the time and work and effort to show you how they can save cost or create value somewhere else. One of my favorite visuals, uh, the Priceberg. I mean, we can see that price. It's visible. It's sitting right there. The question is, what are those other things that affect the efficiency of your operation? And in, in this case, I mean, again, what I try to get across to people is I don't care really where the water line is. Whoever's got the smallest price berg wins. Again, it's a supplier's job to bring these things to you, but it's also working with the people within your organization that are going to use the computers you're going to buy whatever that is, to really say, okay, let's walk through the life of this process. What are the other costs or benefits? What should I be measuring? So it's only part of the picture, and it really comes down to having that discussion and saying, okay, um, you know, where where's the best benefit here? I see a question came up, and I will, I will answer that for sure. Yeah, we can really hold that to the end, out. Todd. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. I was say, we can hold that to the end, Todd. Yeah, Thank appreciate you. the questions, and so come up, bring them on in, and we'll hold them. Thank you all. Yes, please, because I'm going to try to get towards that, but let's have that discussion for sure. So total profit added. I mean, it, it, it's really total cost of ownership is a generally accepted term. People, you know, academics like to debate when things were first used and why, but let's, uh, the, the general consensus is late 70s, early 80s in the IT world. You know, people were going to buy computers and mainframes, and it was going to save time and mistakes and labor and these types of things. But, you know, total cost of ownership, by definition, looks at cost. And I was doing some work with Jim Anderson, this one professor, and he says, you know, really what you're saying is that people should be trying to focus on generating the most profit, sustainable profit. And when you look at a balance sheet, cost is only one part of that. So there's a lot of things that procurement can do that create more value that aren't just cost reduction. So it's kind of just a wider scope. Let me walk through an example, then I'll try to give some examples from other industries, and then I have a few more after this to go through. So it starts by an OEM, somebody that builds the car, the computer, the whatever you're going to buy. Those engineers are making design trade-offs, saying how will this machine operate, what are its operating costs going to be, what's its reliability, these types of things. So they build something, and this is kind of the discussion, at least to my old company, is when they said, you know, we're buying on total cost of ownership, and I asked our chief procurement officer, I said, okay, what are we measuring to make that decision? And it was more around these areas on the acquisition phase. Of course, the price of the product is part of it, but, you know, what's the obsolescence of the product? Can we return products that we don't use? Are there finance charges? Who's paying the shipping cost? Do we have to protect for currency conversions? I mean, uh, can we reduce our supplier base because supplier consolidation? 
And I said, you know, this is very important, but as you can see as we walk through, it's only one component of really looking at where the biggest uh, benefit is for the organization. So somebody made it, procurement bought it, and procurement bought a bunch of printers or company car, whatever it is, for people to install, operate, and maintain, to use whatever they've bought. And again, this will be different for everything you buy, and I'm going to try to give you some examples, but you know, how much energy does it use? How much water does it use? How much ink does it use? What are the operating costs? How long will it last? Can you uh, predict when it will fail? What are the repair costs? I mean, just as an example, I mean, some people might decide to, you know, focus on selling a machine at a lower initial price and try to make up all the, the profit in the spare parts business where you can't substitute in different parts, where you're locked into a service contract maybe. I mean, the, the, the razor blade, uh, razor discussion. I mean, um, you know, can I get parts? When it breaks, does it break so only part of it has to be repaired or do I have to repair the whole thing? Um, does it affect my production? And this will be different for everybody on the phone, but yield, customer throughput, efficiency, the upsides. You know, can you help your uh, organization be more efficient so you can use less people to do something or have a higher fill rate? Those are upside value drivers, not cost down drivers. You know, are there installation costs? Do you need special tools to install it? The warranty cost, you know, is there a long warranty or the warranty packages and these types of things? And then one area that the research didn't look at was disposal cost. And I didn't think of it myself initially because I hate to say the, you know, you throw it away. I mean, the garbage people are coming, you throw it away. But I did some work with uh, some of the big industrial lubricant companies. It just as, I'm gonna throw some names out just so people know what I'm talking about. A British Petroleum, a Chevron, a Exxon Mobil. So they make the lubricants, the oils or the greases that help machines turn. And one of them gave me a rule of thumb, and as a non-engineer, I like some you know mind thought ideas. And they said, the cost to dispose of used lubricant is two and a half times the price to buy it. And I said, I mean, how can that be? Well, you've got to store it, you've got to keep it safe, you've got to hire a company to take it away. They charge all these fees. So sometimes the disposal cost is actually the biggest thing to look at. Real quickly, if anybody's involved in buying capital equipment, let's just say a car as an example. You know, you could probably figure out what the price of the vehicle will be. You know, the shipping cost, the preparatory cost, the financing cost. You probably know what the, somewhat what the cost out the door for that car is. But when it comes to operating costs, how much research do we do there? And I believe most of the car companies will all measure uh, miles per gallon as an example. But some of the other costs in the operating phase that most people don't look at are average repair cost. And a piece of research I've seen, and I'm not saying it's bad, but the new aluminum vehicles are four to five times more expensive to repair than the standard steel vehicles before them. I guess aluminum, when it gets crushed, you can't unbend it. You have to replace a bigger part of it, and you need special machines to do it. Okay, now you could do a what if. Well, one in 10 vehicles gets in an accident, what's that gonna cost us? Insurance cost. I used to think that insurance was more based on the person driving the vehicle, where they lived, how many accidents they had, how old they were. Different cars in the same class will have different types of insurance based on really different things, you know, the cost to repair, the safety factor, but also the theft, the percentage of the vehicles that get stolen. And then disposal, when you're looking at a car, is actually the resale value. I'm not here to promote one vehicle over another, but uh, there are websites, uh, True Cost to Own, uh, Kelly Blue Book, there's a bunch of them that say, okay, based on this information, we believe the resale value of that vehicle would be this. We should be looking at the difference between what we bought it for, what we sell it for, divided over the number of months, and then the positive or negative cost associated with operating it. So with almost anything, you can follow this model. So you're gonna get the slides and you can almost post this up on the wall and just walk through the life of a product or service and you'll find that they kind of fit in these areas and don't get too concerned if it's operation or disposal, but it's trying to get a mindset to walk through. Now the question is, you know, where are the big numbers? Where should we be investing our time to look at things? So some outside information. Accenture did a study, oh darn it, 14 years ago, I believe it is now. The, the, the numbers still hold validity and I think are of interest. They took a look at four different types of products to, that people could buy 
and you can see the red bar at the bottom is the initial purchase price of the asset and that gold color, that yellowish gold color is the operating and disposal cost. The purpose of the study, to be honest, was telling people that made airplanes and trucks to get into the service business. But it doesn't matter. What they're showing is that 85 to 90 percent of the cost is when you're using something. So an airplane, if, if anybody has to go buy an airplane from Boeing, as an example, that only represents 8 percent of the cost. 92 percent of it's, you know, while they run it. Fuel being the biggest cost. So if anybody remembers when fuel was $4 a gallon, jet fuel was even higher. The big airplane, or sorry, the carriers, the deltas of the world, actually were putting planes out to rest in the desert. It was cheaper to buy new planes and they operate the less efficient old ones. Um, you know, so there's just different things to look at here. So when you get to industrial equipment, pumps, fans, gearboxes, or the pickup trucks on the right, this is for a pickup truck for work, not for personal use, when you're paying a driver or a person to use it. Maybe it makes sense to buy the asset for 10% more if the operating costs are 2% less. And I had some engineers, and thank goodness for the smart engineers, but they said, Todd, you know, 10% is better than 2%. Said, but you need the denominator to do the math. I'm not trying to be, you know, too detailed here, but 10% of 12 is 1.2% of the total cost. So if you have an option of a $10,000 machine and one that's, you know, 11,000, it's 10% more, wow. But what if, and again, it's the supplier's job to give you this data in ranges and, and probabilities, but 2% of 88, and it's 0.88 plus 0.88, which is 1.76. 2% of 88 is about 45% bigger than 10% of 12. Again, big impacts, and what I think is interesting from the world of government procurement is you not only buy the asset, but then you operate the asset. In some industries, people buy, you know, build the building, but they don't have to live in the building. Um, I heard this, and I can't remember which company told me, but they said the, the cost to build a new building only represents 12% of its total cost. 88% of it's used during the life of the building, the energy, the taxation, the repairs. I don't remember all the specifics, but again, there's an amazing amount of information on the internet. And, you know, I can just tell you that, okay, I mean, maybe it's 85-15. I don't care if it's 80-20. The ratios hold true. A great buddy of mine, he's a procurement uh, expert. He's a Scottish but lives in England. He's been doing this his whole life. He, he put this together. So Rob said, you know, Todd, you have to realize there's different things have different weightings and ratios. And real quickly, I mean, you can see some things. It's the initial purchase price, and that's it. The only way to figure this out is to ask the supplier to do the work. Again, we'll get later on how to negotiate for it because for them to do the work, they're going to want to get rewarded, get the order for doing it. But, you know, photocopiers, real quick story, won't name the company, but they decided uh, photocopiers for the people that work from home needed to be standardized. Makes sense. It actually was an IT project to begin with because the information technology people were sick of everybody that worked from home calling in having a problem with their printer. It was like, which printer, is it the driver, is there a conflict? And then also, should everybody be getting whatever printer they want? So the procurement organization did a specification, what's needed, went to the supplier and said, okay, here's what we require. Desktop computer, it needs to have the ability to scan things. Uh, we don't care about faxing anymore. We scan documents and send them. It should have color. Eh, we don't really care about speed of printing. They went through all these things and said, okay, you know, what do you think? And the uh, supplier, distributor, came back and gave three options. And the company chose the lowest price that met the requirement. They didn't look at the price of the ink. Okay, and then somebody said, well, you know, that's not hard to do. All you have to do is say, you know, what's the price of the ink? $40, $45.50, as an example. And I said, well, which one's better, the 40 or well, the $40 ink's better than the $50 ink? And I said, think about that. It should be the average price to print to page. Maybe, and I don't know this, but maybe the $50 ink, because it's a bigger size or more efficient or whatever, you know, you should take those costs and try to figure out on average. And sometimes you're going to have to do some guesstimates. How much paper do people print at home? Let's try it. And it's called a sensitivity analysis. But, you know, let's just try, you know, 50 pages a month. Let's try 150. If there's no real variation, okay, we're within the ballpark here. We're close enough. And because you're using the same variables for all the options, it's not that big of an impact as it sounds. If you get a huge difference, maybe you have to do some more research, but sometimes taking a reasonable estimate is good enough to start that discussion.
And some, on, I just put this in there, consumers. And I just, real, real quickly, so this is about, uh, you know, somebody buying the new, um, I hate to say, the European washers and dryers, the front-loading washers and dryers. When they came to North America in 2001, approximately, uh, they didn't sell very well. I mean, they were, whatever, 50% higher price, but they kept saying to consumers they use less water and less energy. But if there was no number put against less water, it didn't mean anything to, in general, most North Americans, even though people care about sustainability. They finally started doing some work, and you know, some of their advertising started to show that for a family of four, you know, the price savings could be made up in three and a half years. Now, do I know how long a washer and dryer is going to work? Not specifically, but I'm going to assume it's more than three and a half years, you know, whether it's five or eight or nine, but I should feel pretty comfortable with that. This is General Electric's uh, calculator just showing, you know, uh, the value of switching light bulbs. And one of my favorite ones, because I travel extensively, and I think this might be an interesting takeaway. Um, so this is Europe, but again, North America has uh, similar types of price structures by carriers. So this is British Air, a traditional carrier, we'll call them, fighting against low-price carriers. Not low cost, but low-price carriers. And I used to spend a lot of time in London, England. And once in a while when I was there, I would go down to uh, Paris. And uh, you get in your routine. So I used to leave my event, and there's a train that would take you right to Heathrow. It ran very quickly, like every 10 minutes, and it cost, I'll just use dollars to keep the, the numbers uh, simple without trying to convert, but say it was $10. And one of my colleagues said, hey, you should fly, I think it was Ryanair, you know, the price of the ticket won't be 200, it'll be, let's just say 100 or 90, whatever. Said, okay, it's a short flight, they've got to be safe, you know, saves the company $100, why not? I mean, it's not a 12-hour flight and, you know, all I need to do is just cram myself in the seat and get the hour flight. So it was great till we finish our event at the business school and my procurement friend I mentioned earlier, Rob, was there and I go, yeah, I'm going to go get the, the, the Heathrow Express. And he goes, uh, didn't you say you were flying out of LG something? And I said, uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, what Gatwick. And I'm like, no, it's his London airport. And he goes, yeah, but we have two airports, Todd, and you've actually chosen to fly out of Gatwick. And I'm like, uh, where's the train to Gatwick? And he starts laughing. There is no train to Gatwick. Well, how do I get there? You need a black cab. And this is at the times when they didn't take credit cards, by the way. So he gave the driver 60 pounds, $100 to get me there. So I get there, I go to check in, and of course I'm you know, doing a 10 day European tour, so I've got the bag, they check all that, et cetera, et cetera. I'm frustrated, get on a plane, shut my eyes, I guess. We, we land in uh, Paris, and it's you know, the pilot with the English accent says, uh, you know, welcome to Paris, have a good, and I look out the window and I go, this is not Charles de Gaulle, the big airport that I'm used to, which happens to have a train below it that takes you into town every eight minutes or something. We're to uh, Orly, which is a completely different airport. And the only way to get from Orly downtown is a cab or to rent a car. It should be the total cost for me to get from my one place to my other place that's reasonable. And I didn't realize the problems until I started, until it actually happened to me. So it's not the price of the ticket. Again, it's the price to check in, the baggage, all these other things. But, you know, my time landing at uh, De Gaulle, taking a train downtown, was probably 50% cheaper than taking the lowest price flight. So again, if you are in charge of getting travelers, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Yeah, let's keep moving along here. So I uh, get the impression you know, there's a lot of suppliers who are going to come to you and say, you know, we can provide the lowest cost solution. And they might have a tool, okay? It's great that they have a tool, but here's some things to be careful for. You should be allowed to change the numbers to do some what-if scenarios. Um, there should be benchmark data where you can start with. I, I don't know what energy costs. You know, there should be a link that says, you know, the average cost of energy in Canada is this per kilowatt or something. So there should be some directional information. It should be changeable. And there should be some credibility associated with it. And finally, the calculations need to make sense. So visually, you know, a, you know, a fool with a tool is still a fool. Just because they've got a tool doesn't mean that they've got all the data behind it. I once had an engineer show me a calculation that claimed to do a total cost analysis. It was 5,000 lines of code, I think. And I said to him, do you understand that, you know, when I change this number, why that number changes? And he goes, no, the, you know, the, the software's been changed so many times. So I feel comfortable to ask those questions. Where's this assumption from? Where's this happened before? What's the probability that it will happen? Um, just because there's a number there and a tool doesn't mean it's right. 
So over the years, and for the procurement people, I mean, hopefully you've seen some sort of uh, Peter Kraliak's uh, work over the years. And as it was written in 1983, purchasing must become supply chain, procurement, strategic, you know, for companies. And I'm uh, you know, assuming government does somewhat the same thing at the beginning of every few years. Take all your supplier buckets, travel, office supplies, whatever those things are, and put them into one of these four buckets. And based on which quadrant they're in, negotiate differently. So real quickly, on the x-axis is spend. The idea being, you know, should you focus on the billion dollar spend or the hundred thousand dollar spend? The bigger the denominator, you know, you should be focusing on. And what most people look at is risk, not business contribution, but risk. So if it's a low dollar value and it's easily to substitute, there's another player in the market that has a similar product, there's no backlogs, there's no supply constraints. I mean, you don't want to spend a lot of time and effort working these people. You want easy billing. You want transparency. I mean, don't put all your resources there. But if they're really big in spend dollar wise, and you can substitute them, I mean, that's you know, that's a way to negotiate and leverage because you could easily switch to another person to supply those goods. If it's a low dollar spend, but it's strategic, i.e., there's a lack of supply. People that are responsible for buying chemicals or primary metals or things like this. I mean, there's constraints sometimes in the world, so they have to supp you know, sign long-term supply agreements, even joint ventures. And then there's those very few suppliers that are such a big dollar amount to you and are so important to you. Your IT, your software, your 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 parts for running your business, whatever those are, you'll treat them differently. And the way I've seen this implemented kind of follows that logic. The only concern I have is people seem to focus on spend. And I think we should be focused on profit impact. Maybe switching, as an example, a hundred million dollar spend from one supplier to another one that's, you know, you've, it's been pushed down over the years, you might save a million dollars. And let's say that's better than the switching cost, so you do it. But there might be a $10 million spend in some other smaller spend but with the right application of the knowledge and the, you know, the really bringing the right people to bear on it could save $2 million or create $2 million of profit impact. You know, the, the denominator, the $10 million isn't should what be looking at, it's the profit impact. So again, at the beginning when you're having that discussion, Mr. Suppliers in this area of goods and services, how can you make this more, and again, efficient, profitable, whatever words you want, I mean, maybe there's small numbers we're falling over all the time to get to big numbers, but the real money's in the small numbers that add up. Here's an example, and you know, don't worry about the specifics of it, but I had a discussion once and, uh, on, on my buy side responsibility, but also on my sell side responsibility. And just to give you a flavor of the market that I was involved with at the time, it was a contract that would be held for a period of five years. Okay, and one supplier was saying that they'd offer a price savings of 10% off invoice upfront type of a situation, and there might have been rules at the end of the year type thing. But either way, it was a you know a check was going to be handed over, and uh, I was arguing that you know a 10% annual profit improvement was better, and the argument was well they're both 10%. Why would one be better than the other one? And these were kind of some of the thoughts that were going through the the team's mind, you know. Okay, it's helped for uh, five years. There's inflation scenarios, there's indexes in both scenarios, so we're both offering, so we'll take those out to keep it as simple as we can. Um, the improvements that the annual profit improvement offering is uh, become sustainable. So they're gonna come in and help us become more efficient in some aspect of whatever we do. That becomes a learned skill that our team has, and that's an ongoing benefit. And then we'll assume that the price savings becomes cash. Energy costs don't go up or nothing else happens. And uh, so one person said, you know, why would I do all the work to sit down every year, you know, discuss what value was created, measure it, uh, you know, all these types of, you know, key performance indicators and the like, you know, 10% to 10%. I said, actually, the one on the right is worth a lot more than the one on the left. So assume it's a million dollar buy, just for argument's sake. At the end of the first year, we can get that down to 900,000, say in 2017. And the other option is to come in and focus on energy savings. And again, it's a supplier's job to explain how they do that, okay? But the comment was, at the end of the year, we're no better off. And I said, okay, well, and he goes, the, the energy one's kind of risky. And I said, well, let's make them guarantee they will save us 10%. As long as we, we'll get to this in a minute, as long as we agree on what's the value and how we measure it, and it's hard, I don't really care where it is as long as it's in my business somewhere. 
So there's no downside. Both of them are 10%. You know, it's okay, but again, there's going to be more work if I have to do this for the supplier group. So, yeah, but what happens in year two? You know, inventory reduction, parts consolidation, whatever program they have around that. The price option is in a 10% price decrease every year. There's no public company, well, at least in the heavy industry world, that has a margin that can afford that. They're publicly traded. They make 10%. So, uh, you know, they can't do that every year. I'm trying to get the suppliers to every year make me more efficient. And again, it's their responsibility. Inventory, making my machines last longer, making them use less ink, uh, lubrication cost, uh, production increase. Again, as long as we agree on what we care about and how we're going to measure it, kind of interesting that a 10% uh, price reduction is worth 10%, but a 10% annual compounded uh, profit improvement is worth 26%. 2.6 times more, and I think it's uh, $800,000 more cash for the business over the five years. Again, the supplier's got to come up with the ideas and uh, be able to deliver that, but I think this is a great example going back to, the, I think it was the first slide that showed companies that do this are more profitable. And again, I know government has some different uh, rules of how it operates, but again, you can be more efficient, have more dollars to spread over more people to do more things, with the same logic. One of the really neat pieces of takeaways from the government research, this vested sourcing, you're going to get a, a short version of it, a white paper called Unpacking Best Value. And uh, Kate and myself were presenting at a contracting conference. And I thought this was really interesting. She said, you know, how many of you on the procurement side, it was a procurement conference, actually use penalties in your contracts, service level agreements, if that translates. And for those of you that that's not part of your world, you know, I want every supplier to guarantee they're going to have 95% parts availability, that my photocopiers will be up and available 92% of the time, that the trains will run at 98% of, I mean, again, so they're going to hit a target and they're going to say, if you don't hit that supplier, here's the penalty. And most people had variations of those. And then she goes, you know, let's stop and think for yourself what the supplier is going to do in, under those circumstances. You're never going to get higher than the threshold of the punishment. And I thought, okay, this is interesting, Kate. Where are you going to go with this? And she goes, okay, we're just going to use a simple example. Uh, you know, people have been required to promise 95% availability. They're halfway through the contract. They're running at 90%. They're going to look and say, what will it cost me to get to that target versus what will the penalty be? So, you know, if it's going to cost me a million dollars to get to the target and the penalty is less than that, it, it's not a rational decision to spend more money, to lose money. So the argument is, well, increase the penalty. And the argument, well, I can just tell you from a supplier's point of view, if the penalty becomes too high, it's like, what would, you know, people don't even want that business. So I, I was really intrigued, like, well, what do you mean? So she goes, you're never going to get above the 95%. And I said, okay. So you're running at 95%. You know, the supplier is not going to go in and spend more money to make it 96%. You know, every dollar they spend above that with no return is actually theoretically wasted capital. She goes, what you need to do is use the carrot and the stick. Because if it's just the stick approach, it becomes the ceiling. You never exceed it. What if I said, if you don't hit 95%, here's your penalty. But if you exceed 95%, here's your reward. We well, you just have to figure out what's it worth to go from 95 to 96%. And a good ratio is 40 to 60% of that profit impact to be given to the supplier. Now the supplier's got an incentive to say, I'm going to exceed that every time I can do it. Again, companies that contract with the, you know, the penalty and the reward clause seem to do much better than ones that just have a penalty clause associated with it. This is just one example. It's North American for the people on the, the webinar. MDOT is for the Minnesota Department of Transportation, a state in the northern US. I don't remember exactly when it happened, but a huge bridge collapsed. There's two cities, there's the Twin Cities, and there's a big artery bridge that goes across, and uh, a lot of people took it every day. And this won a big award uh, a bunch of years ago kind of for following this logic. And they said, so for government procurement, you have to proactively say, how am I going to make my award decision? So they came up with three areas. You had to meet the minimum criteria. You had to be uh, approved to bid. You had to have ISO or quality or whatever those requirements are. But okay, once you meet these requirements and you're going to build a bridge that'll work, you know, these types of requirements, we're going to make the selection based on a weighted average of these three things. So the bid price of the bridge, how many millions of dollars you're going to charge me, 
how long it will take you to build the bridge. Um, there was a lot of cost to the cities rerouting traffic, but there was a lot of cost to pedestrians, the environment. I mean, so they said, okay, every day that it takes longer to build the bridge, we're going to value that at $200,000 a day. And there's going to be a third average, kind of a subjective, uh, qualitative, you know, what is their sustainability policy? What is the aesthetics of the bridge? Okay, as long as you say what you're going to measure on how you're going to do it, a committee sat together, and you can read the, the chat, not the chapter, but the section in the white paper that gets specific. But this was the uh, proposals that came in, and you can see variation on the price from 176 million to 233. So uh, a huge percentage of difference in dollars. Um, the number of days to complete were a uh, big variation. Uh, but you can also see this technical proposal score. When they averaged it out, the highest price bridge that actually took the longest to build actually was the best value for the citizens of Minnesota uh, and had an adjusted score. This has won numerous awards in the public sector and in the private sector for saying, okay, how do we contract to get what we quantify as value? And again, this is legal because it's predetermined ahead of time of what's going to be measured and how. So some final thoughts. Again, companies that do this, governments that do this on the buy side or the sell side, I won't go through all this, but from an academic perspective, um, for those of us on the phone that are from Europe, um, IMD is a big school in Switzerland. They've got a global procurement conference that I've gone to for four or five times now to talk about this. Um, government associations, I had a chance to present at the National Institute of Government Procurement uh, four or five years ago. PASIA is Asia, IB Corp is Brazil, Logi is Finland, CAPS is American, but again, a bunch of government procurement people saying we've got to get better at trying to get that value. And governments that have changed, I've actually got some attached slides that you'll all get that have some specifics from all these, but um, I think it's North Carolina. And they actually went in and changed the rule for buying to buy best value. It might require for whatever your area of responsibility is, to go back to the procurement law and get it updated. But there's a bunch of examples of people that have done it that say, okay, from lowest price that meets the minimum criteria in a closed bid or whatever format to, you know, the best value for our citizens will be measured, taking into consideration these things. And then whenever a tender is let, you then explain what those ratios will be. And then finally, a bunch of consultants. One comment I get all the time is we just don't have the data. And for financial people or engineers, they always want the final number, that exact number. You know, energy to the fourth decimal point. I love this Colin Powell thing. It's, you know, if you wait to have 100% of the data, it's too late. You've lost all those opportunities. You, I know our guts we can't live on, but, uh, you know, once you've got a good enough feeling, as I said earlier with the uh, photocopier example, it's the delta between the two options. Is it 9.7 cents or 9.43 cents? What time of day will the energy be used? Okay, fine. We're going to make a reasonable attempt to put a number down. It might be too big for government to look at, but what some companies have done, big global companies, they actually send out an appendix, I guess you'd call it, or an addendum every year saying, these are the numbers we'll use. Here's our weighted cost of capital. Here's our importing cost. Here's our cost of inventory. So they set some, I hate to say cheat sheet, but some numbers that say, okay, it might be different here and there, but this is what we're going to use. So if you wait to have everything 100% correct, it'll be too late to really get the benefit. As we get to kind of the end here, I love this slide because I think it's a great takeaway. The gentleman that used to run procurement for one of the big steel companies in, in America, he was a consultant, but I met him, oh, seven years ago. But I love this. On the left-hand side, um, this is procurement's perspective of salespeople. How good do salespeople do at bringing value in the proposals? So they're asking procurement, people like yourself, you know, how good are salespeople? And they put the slide up first, and you know, sometimes and seldom and never constitute 89%. So I'm sitting there going, whoa, as a salesperson, basically 90% of the time you're not bringing any value over and above just meeting the requirement. So shame on salespeople. But at the same time, you look and ask salespeople, how often does procurement care? How often will procurement reward? How often do they put this as part of their decision-making process where they want more than just price that meets the criteria? Disagree, strongly disagree, neither disagree. Again, you're at some whatever, 80%. I think it's a lack of communication on both sides. 
So all I suggest is in your RFP, RFIs, et cetera, say, you know, we're looking how you're going to make this more, and again, you have to use your own words, efficient, again, profitable is kind of the generic term I use, but, you know, and we will reward the people that bring this to us. They will get the business. Because if they don't think you care about it, they're not going to do the work to come and show you how that you can be more efficient. So I think this is the last slide. This is what some best-in-class people of the companies, I have in quotes here, the do's and the don'ts, the do's. Everybody's got to agree. So you've got to get the users that you're buying for together with yourselves to say, okay, you know, what do we really care about? And you want to know it's what's good for the, the, the ministry that you're in. You know, maybe you could save a dollar here, but maybe the operating cost goes way up there. At the end of the day, it's how do you become more efficient as a group? So it takes that cross. I don't mind if they're, you know, go up, but ours goes down. It's the overall benefit. Don't spend too much time. Again, your suppliers can do this for you, but what are your TCO drivers? Again, is energy a big component of what you spend your money on? If it's a quarter of 1%, maybe you know that won't be the big focus. But really sit down and look at your efficiency areas, your drivers, where is the biggest cost that we could really be, be focusing on? And then you know, explain those to your suppliers. I just mentioned, if you can get some benchmarks for the group across the US. So not every group all the time is arguing over every little number. So the value of labor, I mean, again, we can be more efficient, et cetera, et cetera, put a number there, and it's close enough to start. Again, at least to the companies that I've worked, they've usually had an annual or biannual, whatever, uh, supplier day, where they've actually had, my CEO used to always stand up and talk about this. We gave an award every year, and the best award was given to a supplier where the price of the machines were two and a half times the price of the initial bid, but they were so much more efficient. The cost savings from the lubrication, the energy, and the water savings paid for them in 2.2 years on a 15-year machine. So, I mean, he made it clear, I'm a publicly traded company. My job is to be more efficient long-term. Um, I talked about the reward and penalize, the carrot and the stick, you, you know, do both. Uh, one thing that I find, and I guess it's probably different for everybody on the phone, but in some industries, let's just say it's only procurement that has to find efficiencies or cost savings. Or you want to know what the people that are working within the group should have? You know, they might have ideas that you'll never see because they're closest to using the machine or doing the activity. So have a way for them to send you an email, whether it's a generic mailbox that says somewhere, you know, how do you make the Department of Labor more efficient? Whatever it is, send them in. Have somebody scan them once in a while. Reward, again, I, you know, whether that's a raise, whether that's a trip, whether that's a promotion, I don't know. But there's a lot of ideas that come from people that maybe you wouldn't expect that are closer to the activity or the usage of the product or service. The do nots. You know, I've seen some companies that have done this and they've taken the cash out where procurements come in and said, aha, I've saved some money for you by whatever, however, and they take the money out of that department's budget, leaving them no better off. Best practice is to leave half the savings. Let's just say you've got a, a building that using $10 million of energy and you get it to $9 million. There's a million dollar savings. Maybe half that savings goes back to you, goes back to the, the balance sheet. But half of that they get to respend. And not for a, a party, but they've got to have ideas of how they want, want to upgrade this, fix this. But if there's no incentive for them to do it, you're going to find even more resistance. It's, I hate to say found money. And again, they've got other projects that are in the pipeline that this money can be reprioritized to. Anytime a supplier says, trust me, <laughs> you know, make them do the work. I don't accept, uh, you know, trust me's or it's obvious. Uh, one big oil and gas company, uh, the CEO actually took away price substitution as a savings. Because there was a lot of substitution, there was a lot of savings, but it never got to the bottom line. So he goes, you want to know what? I'm not sure those are true, and then I get in my bottom line, so I'm not going to even accept it anymore. And yeah, the last and the last one, real quickly, and, and just something to think about: rewarding innovation. And I'm just going to tell a quick story that I heard from somebody once I who mentioned it. But this is their perspective on how government was procuring what they produced. Okay, so take it for what it's worth. But he said, you know, there's no value for me coming there and doing the work, saying, you know, you you said you wanted this. Did you think about this? Or maybe we could do this, or make the vehicle lighter or faster. Like bringing all these ideas because. All that ever happens is those ideas get taken back into the uh, the government agency. Then they take those ideas and they split them out to all my competitors and say, here's what to bid on. So I end up doing all the engineering work, all the hard work, and then those ideas go to all my competitors that spend no 
time, effort, or work finding those savings. And this person then said, you know, what we've learned to do is bid what is asked for, wait six months, get the contract, and make it all up and change fees. I don't remember the exact term, but, you know, once they've got the contract going in and saying, hey, we could do this to make you more efficient. So just put that in the back of your mind that, I mean, is it better to get the value up front or to have them, suppliers, kind of start to think this way? But I can also see how the suppliers say, I can't afford to put a team on this initiative to go in and say, hey, this is what you asked for, but here's best practice, here's a new way, et cetera, et cetera, and really, you know, give best practices to help the, the ministry be better, but at the end of the day, lose the business. I know one big company in Europe, they actually don't bid 55% of the opportunities now because of that same reason. And I'm talking to Fortune 1000 company. So just put that in the back of your mind. How do you make sure that those suppliers come to you first with their best ideas? So I'm just throwing this out there. These are two organizations. I'm not related to them or anything like that, but have tools that can help you do this. Over the years, when I've done this, people have said, well, you know, we don't have a tool. Uh, Tim Underhill on the left, Sourcing Strat, he's done some work with the U.S. Post Office and another government agency. I can't remember the name right now. It's on his website. You can talk to Tim. But uh, I know the U.S. Post Office is only, I'd say, half government. But, again, a software that you can structure, that you can kind of put weightings on these things, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, one on the right, TCL Toolkit. I'm going to say it's from South Carolina, but it's in the Carolinas somewhere. And I know they've done a bunch of work with the local government there, kind of a vendor neutral kit, uh, services a software tool. So those are links just for you to have. And, uh, you know, as I always say, value needs to be quantified. It's the supplier's job to do it. Tell them you're rewarded if they do the work. And I think you'll get uh, even more value for your uh, organization. The orange paper on the right, um, you know, Frank's going to send out with the slides. And the book on the left, like you said, it's kind of interesting. It's got a sales perspective and a procurement perspective, but it's not opposite sides. That's when we sit down with our suppliers on the same side and say, make me more efficient. That's all I care about. So with that, Frank, I think we have plenty of time for some questions. I'll leave it up to you to fire away. Great. Thanks very much, Todd. Uh, that was excellent and good information. I I think there's a lot of really cool stuff in there, all the, the total cost of ownership versus, you know, uh, the the initial ticket price. So I think this is going to be good. I know we have two questions right now. Uh, one comes in from Professor Joe Sandor from Michigan State University. Hi, Professor Sandor. Uh, he asks why we don't know how to negotiate it. I'm going to actually, Joe, if you want to open up the line, you, you can ask the question yourself. But, I mean, I think basically your question is, you know, cost isn't necessarily a, a bad thing um, and sometimes you can get network value added but but Joe do you want to see if I can take Joe off off mute here uh, so he can while I'm doing that actually Todd let's go to a second question from Noel Asama he asks or she asks how do you figure out what are the right questions to ask um, when it's like a different situation? Are there general questions that you always ask to help you figure out value? Do you have a system or a checklist? Give, yep, give and, us uh, and, some ideas on how to ask the yep, right questions. Yep, yep. If you remember that slide, and I, I'm just going to see if I can yeah, quickly put this in the, whatever that's called screen mode here. Again, this will be different for everything you buy, but if you walk through the, you know, walk the life of the product or service, you know, whether that's photocopiers. I mean, you know, so walking it through that life, you can start to, you know, in these different areas. So when I do workshops with people, usually people bring numerous different examples, and we start walking it through. That, okay, what are the costs when we're, you know, acquiring it? I mean, or shipping it or receiving it? You know, is there installation cost or operation? So again, eventually you start to put these numbers around it. Um, also just asking the supplier. I mean, if I'm selling photocopiers and I'm yeah. not a photocopier salesperson, that's what they do for a living. They've done it for 100 years. So say, hey, come in and show me how you, and I, your, my print costs go down or my print efficiency go up and ask them to bring in some, some uh, expertise and really to engage the users. And I just know some companies, I mean, uh, they either assume that it's so obvious what the value drivers are, there's no need to bring in the users. It seems to be one of the reasons. Again, one company I know very well, I mean, they know who their travelers are. I mean, they've got to spend. But to have, you know, one annual conference call that says, okay, what could we negotiate for that would make a big difference? And, and, and just real quickly, what one company did, it, their travel situation was different than most, but a lot of their travel was last minute. It was a consulting company. 
So, you know, you could argue rebates, et cetera, et cetera. And I won't say any names here, but they made a deal where they always got a certain fare of ticket in business class, even though it was bought with only so many hours of notice. So, you know, a business class ticket for six grand versus that last second $14,000 number. And because they just talked to their people and said, you know, what can we do to help save more money? They said, the biggest problem is, is the client waits to the last minute and says, we need you in Japan. And, you know, you call with 50 hours notice or whatever it is, the price is through the roof. So they contract with some airline saying, if we call, we want that whatever K fare, Y fare, I don't know, whatever fare that is. And a few of the uh, airlines were more than willing to do it because they want all that business travel or business. Again, just an example by asking the users of the product or services what would be a value. I think you'll start to get a lot of different drivers to think about. I'm glad you, you mentioned asking the suppliers, you know, and the users, but specifically the suppliers. If you're doing market research, uh, that is one of the questions that you definitely want to ask when you start identifying suppliers and well before you develop a requirement. Uh, you know, what are your cost drivers? You know, I understand that, you know, this is your ticket price, this is your list price. What other things am I going to have to buy or, or lease or, or whatever um, to maintain your product? So that's definitely a good, a good response there. Uh, Donald Jones is asking Todd if, if they may use excerpts of uh, your materials if they cite you. Um, of course. So we're going to yeah, that's, that's, that's the, so yes, that answer is I, yes. I do enjoy, I mean, my email's on there. For, you don't have to. Feel free mm -hmm. to use as you will, but I'd love just to know where it's being used, just out of interest. So send me an email and just say, you know, where you're using it. I, as an appreciation is all, but thank you. Go right ahead. Right on. Um, Joe, we have like two minutes, and I'm just taking you off. Well, you're you're not muted. I don't know if you want to. Uh, I can't I can't take you off mute. Maybe if if Joe's able to speak, I don't know that, that we're going to be able to get the and professor. Not, if you repeat Joe's question, and Joe, my email's on here. Fire me an email. I mean, I'm jumping on a plane tomorrow morning, but believe it or not, I'm in Michigan. <laughs> I'm in a place called Auburn Hills. So. We're in the same time zone, and it'd be great to talk to you whenever it fits to get into more detail. But let's see if I can give it a quick, quick try. Uh, Frank, if you could reread the question or read. Yeah, the, I'll I'll read it. It's, I think it might be more of a general comment. So okay, so okay, sorry. Why why we don't know how to negotiate it? Uh, this bargaining frame precludes the cost understanding. Seems obvious, but always also seems to come down to a justification of better negotiating concern over terms. Cost is not a dirty four-letter word, although price may be. The lowest cost is the highest network value added. So, yeah, yeah, you know, the, yeah, but you know, the, the, the highest cost, I mean, the, the, the highest price can be the lowest cost, you know, sure. and, and uh, the one thing, and again, I, I'm not sure I'm answering specifically, but sometimes people look at cost just in that acquisition phase. They don't measure mm -hmm. cost holistically, you know, cost is, what does it cost me to get it to the house? So you look yeah. at shipping and receiving and that, but wait, once I get it here, you know, his ink costs more than his ink, or this uses more energy, or how long will it last, or can I get repair parts? Exactly. You know, or am I tied into somebody? Is it easy to switch afterwards or not? I mean, mm -hmm. just as an example, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you're buying mobile phones now, there's one system, you can all choose which one that is, that's got you tied in. And yeah. I really think, you know, the switching cost becomes so high that the price of the, the widget doesn't matter anymore. I'm so sunk into it. So I think that's one of the strategies. Mm -hmm. I think I think generally we can conclude on, on this point, but if the price seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, so ask questions, dig deeper, understand the concept of total profit added and how it relates to total cost of ownership. Um, and And... Todd, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak to our audience today. We will be sending out your slides and links to these wonderful resources along with a recording of the webinar where you can watch it again. Um, and let's do this again. This is excellent. So let us know when you got some more content and we'll, we'll, we'll put another webinar together. Perfect. Well, thanks again, uh, Frank and Public Spend Forum for putting this together. If anybody wants to send me an email, they're more than welcome to. But good luck negotiating for the best value for uh, your constituents. Take care and have a thank good week. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye now.